This video is part of a series of interviews with some of the parachute engineers, scientists, and developers who have been responsible for the most significant and advanced parachute systems of the last half century and was created by the Aviation Trail Parachute Museum in Dayton, Ohio. In June 2017, at the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics Forum, Charles Lowry, longtime deceleration researcher and member of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, was interviewed about his work and accomplishments in the parachute industry. Chuck was interviewed by Steve Brown, Vice President of Aviation Trail Incorporated. I was born in Paducah, Kentucky in 1932, and I went to the University of Kentucky and got into the parachute business up in, in that area. I uh, live in Garden Grove, California now, after having uh, moved around the country a bit. What was your education? Where'd you go to school? Went to uh, uh, University of Kentucky, got a degree, a bachelor's in uh, mechanical engineering, and uh, then I proceeded to get my master's uh, also in mechanical engineering at, at the same school. And for mechanical engineering, how did you get involved in parachutes? Well, I was working uh, in an aeronautical lab on the campus of the University of Kentucky while I was getting my master's degree and a parachute company in, uh, in the same city in Lexington, Kentucky, which was Irvin Airchute at the time, uh, needed some temporary help with a peak load of uh, proposals and such that they were involved with. And so they borrowed me for two months and I stayed. Ah, that's interesting. Leslie Irvin was the first guy to test a free fall parachute that's in the right. field. I worked for him personally. I was his gopher. <laughs> Fascinating. Tell us about the most notable programs you worked on and what you did. Well, I worked on uh, the... Uh, first, I went to um, Columbus, Ohio as a parachute man, having worked at Irving Airchute. And we worked on uh, Navy aircraft. I worked primarily ejection seats uh, for T2J and for the A3J Vigilante, Mach 2 seat, tough job. And then when uh, the Apollo program was awarded to our West Coast Division, whereas I was in the Columbus Division of North American Aviation, I was transferred to um, to Downey, California, where the Apollo work was being done. So that was, of course, a, a big uh, step for a young guy to work on the Apollo program, go to the moon. Most people didn't believe we would ever do it, but I did, and, and we did. And what, um, what do you think your biggest technical challenge was? Well, on the Apollo program, uh, we had to bring back three uh, live astronauts from the lunar visit and uh, had our system had to be uh, totally reliable and uh, it was a big system uh, and I'm referring back to Gemini and Mercury that had proceeded it each used single parachutes to bring the uh, command module back but we used a cluster of three r rather large parachutes and to get three uh, parachutes to work uh, in a cluster together was a major accomplishment. We used a ring sail parachute and ring sails don't like to work in clusters. Uh, so we had to go into a lot of side development programs to, to give that parachute more capability of working together in a cluster. That was probably the biggest challenge that, that we had. Another uh, one that was almost as big was the Apollo command module started out when I first got on the program it weighed 7,800 pounds by the time we finished the program it was 13,500 pounds and we had uh, no increase in volume allowance to store our parachutes so we had to uh, develop a means of, of uh, getting more out of our parachutes packing them tighter and uh, taking advantage of every cubic inch of space uh, on the spacecraft in order to stow the parachutes. That was a tough one, but it, it all came out okay. 
How about how about some work experiences that might be odd, strange, funny, or important um, in your mind? Well, the Apollo program was uh, quite an endeavor, quite an experience. Uh, I worked on Apollo 13 years. Not all of that was parachutes. I had pyros and I had uh, or the ordnance systems, I had the docking system. I had a lot of a lot of systems before it was over. So we had a, a lot of um, tough times. Um, times that seemed impossible to get through and with all the systems I had it seems I was always in trouble with uh, you know the customer and uh, the program and because we had failures all the time that we had to work on and uh, our parachute system though was uh, probably the biggest program ever in parachutes um, we made a, a 147 parachute drop tests and uh, that's unheard of uh, in, in either before or after. Uh, we uh, had to go through three different block numbers, like we started with block one spacecraft, which had a certain uh, characteristic, and then the Apollo fire came in 1967. And then a lot of things changed, and the weight went up, and then we came to a block two system and the parachutes were somewhat different and we had to to then develop and qualify that system and then later on we had the heavyweight program where the weight went on up and then we had quite a few parachute changes so we really qualified the system three times and only the last one carried live people it turned out proudest moment in your career well it was the lunar landing okay. uh, that's the thing we had all worked toward and, and we believed we could do and um, and the gods were with us that day, and, and it worked, and, uh, and the whole world uh, rejoiced at that. We had, uh, you know, uh, reporters and journalists from all over the world. We had like 200 from Japan only, and there were thousands, uh, and the whole world just kind of joined together at that, at that moment, that, uh, and it, it made such a big splash. So many people were tuned into it and expecting it, and it happened. So that was the pr proudest moment, of course. What about the people you worked with? Who did you most enjoy? Who did you most admire? Well, I worked with a lot of good people and still do on the Iran program. Uh, I'm associated with people that I've known since the 50s. Uh, some are here at the conference, and it's just a, a, a great experience to, to have walked this, this course with, with some of those fine people. As far as the most admired, it would have to be Theo Kanaki, who was really one of the grandfathers of the parachute industry, the scientific approach to parachutes. And of course his manuals we've used and his data for, for many years. Theo Kanaki was a very close friend of mine, and I worked with him on a number of programs. He was a gentleman and uh, a scholar and he, ha he was the one person who collected parachute data from the time he came into this country from Germany, right after World War II. And then he was able to compile all that data when the rest of us were just users. But he, he put it all together. And today, every parachute designer has his manual on their desk. He was uh, uh, the most admirable person in, in this industry that I've ever known. Tell us about what it was like when you first got into the field. Though. Well, as a young engineer, um, our engineering office was probably uh, six people total. A couple of draftsmen, chief engineer, me, and a secretary, and, uh, and another guy. And uh, We took a lot of orders for parachutes. We, uh, we would design a parachute in 20 minutes. If somebody uh, had no really strict requirements, and we had very crude analytical methods that we used, uh, and oddly it, it, it seemed to work. Of course, when you get into sophisticated systems like space flight and so on, you've got to be better than that. You've got to have analytical techniques that, of course, we didn't have. So uh, it was pretty crude in those days. What important innovations have you did you see in your in the process and that you might have participated in? Well, in the Apollo program, we of course had to innovate, and we came up with uh, 
highly refined parachute designs. Now we did not have the materials that we have today. And, and so one of the, aside from innovating the, in the parachute design itself and optimizing uh, load carrying structures and so on, the materials are the big thing in parachutes. And I have seen then the introduction of Kevlar and some of the other materials that we use today, which are head and shoulders better than nylon in certain applications. And, uh, and there are even now uh, ma materials that are head and shoulders better than Kevlar. And uh, with the uh, way chemistry goes, uh, we can create synthetic molecules and, and nobody knows how far we can go with materials. So I would say the materials are the biggest improvement in parachutes that of course go along with the uh, optimizing the designs. Well, what, what kind of breakthroughs or developments would you most like, like to see happen along this line? Well, uh, again, more material uh, research. Uh, the thing about parachutes is if they weigh pounds and they occupy cubic feet of volume, and when you have a spacecraft that pinches you so tight that you're only allowed to have so much weight allowance for your system and so much volume allowed, the, the materials are the key to, to beating that. And so I want to see, uh, whereas Kevlar cut the volume that from the old nylon chutes by maybe a third. That's a lot. And if we can have uh, another step in the uh, development of materials that we can use that would cut us another 25% or 30 years, it'd be miraculous. And we need that, and we'll have that someday. Great. Uh, what, what lessons has your work life, what do you think your work life has taught you? Well, I was in, uh, I was in management, low-level management through a lot of my career, and had a lot of good people and uh, one of the lessons I learned was surround yourself with good people and treat them uh, well in terms of giving them a job, giving them a schedule, giving them a, a budget, telling them why it's important and let them go and don't micromanage and don't uh, don't lead them every step of the way. Give them room to work. And that has worked so well for me. And all any success I've ever had is because of the people around me that uh, excelled in what they did. As a business owner, I agree. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Tell us about your immediate family. I have a, uh, my wife is dead. She died two years ago. I have three fine children. One's an engineer who's here he works at the same company I work. He's here at the conference. Uh, one is a, a, a chief financial officer for Deschutes County up in Oregon, and uh, my daughter is a school teacher in uh, in Arizona as well as her daughter. And uh, I'm I'm very proud of my kids. They all have turned out so well. And um, in spite of my being away so much at working on Apollo, they. My wife brought them along, and, and so that's, that's my family. Excellent. Congratulations. Um, what big non-work lessons might you have learned about life? Well, as a takeoff on that last question, uh, on Apollo, we worked weekends and nights and holidays, and I mean, that was a way of life. And um, it was very widely done that way across the program, and, and of course, there were somewhere between a quarter million people and 400,000 people working on Apollo and and a lot of people did that kind of excess work uh, schedule and one of the things I learned out of that was don't do that. Um, a family, when a man or a lady has a family, they have obligations that take precedent over their work. And so there's a delicate balance there. You want to do your job and you want to do it well and you want to excel at it, but you don't want to do that at the expense of your family and your church and your friends and, 
in uh, other parts of your life? Well, being able to keep that in, in the right priority, what would you recommend to someone new in the industry and in trying to join the parachute industry? <clears throat> well, I see a lot of young people coming into the industry, uh, lots of them, and I'm so pleased at that. Uh, parachutes are uh, a strange industry. They're not an exacting science and they're very challenging and uh, there's a lot of subjective involvement involved in, in uh, the equations are, are kind of difficult and, and yet these people seem to be attracted to that and uh, the thing I, I keep telling the young people is you're very oriented and very competent in, in uh, analytical methods. You've been trained that way. But go out in the shop and get your hands on the hardware, the hardware being the parachutes in this case. And I really uh, press them on that. And, and our company uh, does that. They, they cause the young people to go out and pack parachutes and see how they're built and feel of them and go out in the field and test them and pick them up after the test and look at them. And so uh, that's the biggest thing. Uh, parachutes um, are flexible and they're delicate and they're, uh, but at the same time is uh, they're very strong and husky and, and you kind of have to learn all over uh, about what you're working with. Uh, kids, you know, know how to turn a bolt and to uh, fix a car or something like that, but textiles are different and you got to get a feel for them and that's, that's what I encourage them. Okay, well we've covered some very interesting territory here, but is there anything that we did not cover that you'd like to add? Well, um, I've come a long way in life and I think I've learned a lot and I think uh, getting the, the whole balance of life figured out individually is it. And I think a person ought to hold his, as I said, hold his family very highly. I think a, a person ought to have high spiritual values. I think a person should have a lot of integrity. I think a person should involve himself in things outside of himself and his family and his church and, and to be a volunteer in things and uh, trying to make the world a, a better place. And that's not just talk, I, I really uh, try to practice that. And I would encourage that for, for everybody. The Aviation Trail Parachute Museum in Dayton, Ohio, tells the story of the development of the freefall parachute from its invention at Dayton's McCook Field after World War I, through the vital role the parachute plays today in the decelerator industry and safely landing spacecraft. The museum includes interactive exhibits, artifacts, historic photographs, and films. Aviation Trail Incorporated has developed a self-guided tour of select aviation-related sites that are open to the public in the Dayton area. Aviation Trail's mission is to preserve and promote the Dayton area's unique aviation heritage, beginning with the invention of the airplane by Wilbur and Orville Wright. Find out more at aviationtrailinc.org.